Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Bible class this morning. I will tell you that I believe there is no better way to begin a new week than to gather with fellow believers to open the Word of God and to see if we can't better equip ourselves to serve the Lord. I'm glad you're here. I appreciate this time that we have together. appreciate you being in our class. I hope you brought your Bible today, and I would ask that you be opening it, please, to the book of 1 Peter. We continue our Sunday morning study of the books of 1 and 2 Peter. We are still in 1 Peter, and we are now ready today to move into chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, I trust you also brought your Sunday school book this morning. That will be lesson number 6 in your foundation study guide. 1 Peter chapter 4, and we read just now the first two verses. So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. As we live our lives in these last days, in these end times, there are very specific attitudes that Peter addresses that believers must possess. Two weeks ago, if you remember, we talked about the attitude of submission. Well, Peter now adds to that discussion the attitude of commitment. He reminds us that this commitment God is calling us to is certainly nothing greater than the commitment that Jesus had in the pain that he endured, the suffering he endured to secure our salvation. And believers in these last days will need to have a commitment to God that will endure even during times of great struggle. Jesus himself talked about this very same idea when he told us anyone who would come after me must take up his cross and follow. That's Matthew 16 verse 24. That, that phrase, that whole idea, taking up the cross meant that you were absolutely committed. You were looking forward. You were not looking back. And Peter says, fellow believers, notice, notice the language he uses. Arm yourselves with the same mind. Arm yourselves with the same attitude Jesus had. You know, I believe that many believers lose their battle against sin because somehow they have become convinced they don't have to sacrifice anything during the course of that battle. So let me remind you of a couple of important truths. It's not a battle if there's no sacrifice. It, it might be something else. It might be something less. Call it what you will. It's not a battle if there's no sacrifice. It's not a battle if it doesn't cost anything. There has to be, there has to be a fight in order for there to be a battle. Peter says you need to arm yourself. You need to prepare yourself for the fight. When a person suffers persecution, in this case he's talking about physical persecution for the sake of Jesus, it always profoundly changes them. It profoundly changes the way they look at sin. It profoundly changes their view of the desires of their own flesh. In my reading this week, one of the writers that I visit often writes of this thought. The phrase that you see there in the text has ceased from sin, or perhaps you have a translation that says, for you have finished with sin. That phrase carries a note of triumph. That person has effectively broken with a life dominated by sin. Now he goes on to say, it does not mean that he no longer commits any act of sin 
for as long as he lives. But it does mean that that old life, that old life that was dominated by the power of sin has now been broken. It's been terminated. Charles Spurgeon would write of this, I beg you to remember that there is no getting rid of sin, there is no escaping its power except by contact and union with the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the text, Peter gives us two thoughts that are so helpful in having the right attitude to follow Jesus. First, Peter says, you, you have finished with sin. You've broken with that old life. And second, you don't spend the rest of your life, therefore, chasing your own desires. You spend the rest of your life anxiously seeking to do the will of God. So let's add 3 through 6 now back to the text. You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy. Their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties, and their terrible worship of idols. Of course, underscore that in your text. Of course your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. So, they slander you. But remember that they will have to face God, who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the and the dead. That is why the good news was preached to those who are now dead. So although they were destined to die like all people, they now live forever with God in the Spirit. So Peter, as we expect, who never minces words, just puts it right out there. Friends, we have all spent enough time living like the world. That's what he's telling his readers. Now we are called to live differently. Now we are called to live like Jesus. And Peter is reminding us that it is a profound and foolish waste of time for Christians to live like the world. I remember as a kid hearing preachers talk about being double-minded. I don't think I've heard that phrase in a long, long time. But I remember hearing preachers talk about being double-minded. You remember that? Double-minded. And I'm sitting there thinking, what in the world is double-minded? What does that mean? Well, this is what it means. And it's sad. It's sad, really, that for some who are believers, they think they have not yet spent enough time doing the will of the world doing the will of the ungodly. Now, I, I know you've heard of the concept, the idea of sowing your wild oats. So it's that idea that I've got some wild oats that I just need to go out and get sown. I've got some experiences in and of the world that I need to have first before I make that whole trip to a commitment to godliness. And Peter is, is not bashful about providing a list of things that should mark the past life of a believer and not his or her present life. Go back and look at the text. Did you pay attention to his list? Immorality and lust is where he starts. Folks, let me ask you. Do you have to look very far? Do you have to look around your own life very far before you see that every single day? And he adds not just drunkenness, but he talks about drunken parties and the terrible worship of idols. You see what he's doing? He is identifying a lifestyle that he saw then, and really it is a lifestyle that hasn't changed all that much in 2,000 years. Now, some of you may have an English translation that uses the word lewdness. You'll find that word lewdness in lots of the English translations just here. And, and that term defined is a word that encompasses, that denotes all kinds of evil. And, and it carries Peter's idea of a lack of personal self-restraint, of, of violating any norm, any sense of decency. And Peter says, listen, listen. 
Folks, you've done that already. You have had enough of that kind of thing in your life in the past. It is godless. Then he also says, of course. Of course now that you are a Christian. Of course now that you have changed your life. Of course now that you have accepted and followed Jesus, your former friends are surprised. They think it is strange that you no longer dive into that flood of all the destructive things that they do. Peter says, you shouldn't be surprised that when you no longer go with the crowd, that the crowd takes note of it. I wonder if we understand that. I wonder if we understand that when you don't participate in the sin that is all around you, by very, the very nature of your non-participation, it convicts those who practice it. And Peter says, guess what? They don't like it. They don't like it. It brings them to speak evil against you. Folks, good shall always be received with contempt by those who practice evil. Always. In our world, not only is good spoken against by those who practice evil, but if you believe in good, you live good, you practice goods, you're not just going to be spoken against, you're going to be, what do they say? You're going to be canceled. You're going to be canceled. The recently completed month of June was an entire month celebrated, dedicated to celebrating a lifestyle that that God says is an abomination in His sight. And whatever you read when you turned your television on, everything around you for that entire month was dedicated to celebrating a style of living that God says is unacceptable. Now, I want to make sure you understand. Jim didn't decide that. I didn't decide that. God decided that. God who created all mankind, God who created a man, God who created a woman, decided. God said, I have made a man and a woman. I made the man for the woman. I made the woman for the man. I made them for each other. It is my will. It is my design. It is a gift. God who said, I didn't make a man for a man. I I didn't make a woman for a woman. That is a perversion. But we now occupy a world that celebrates that perversion. And if you don't celebrate with them, as Peter says, you shouldn't be surprised. They will slander you. But do you see what else Peter says. Look look back at the text very carefully. Peter says, friends, there is a coming accounting that will be given to God. Everybody faces God. And with no sense of glee, but with genuine sadness. When this account is required, all who live in the sins that Peter was describing will clearly see just how foolish they've been. What might be seen now as living the good life by the world's rules, Peter says, very well may not be seen as such in the measure of eternity. And then that idea in verse 6 about the good news being preached to those who were dead. Now, I was really hoping that Dr. Lloyd would handle all of that last Sunday. And with a little, a little glint of glee in his eye, he made sure I understood that while he had some of it in his lesson, it was mentioned again in mine. Dr. Lloyd talked about this last week and about the differing interpretations of exactly what Peter was speaking of. All I can tell you is this. I can tell you that those who are dead live on in the constant awareness of the reality of eternity. They're aware of it. Peter's already told us that that Jesus preached to the spirits in prison 
And he was preaching a message of judgment. We saw that in chapter 3, verse 13. And apparently during this same time, Jesus also preached a message of salvation to the faithful dead in Abraham's bosom. You read about that in Luke chapter 16, who anticipated the coming Messiah, who anticipated the work of the Redeemer that would be done for them on their behalf. I do not read this as an offer for a second chance so much as I read it as the completion of the salvation they look forward to, the completion of the plan of God for those who had been faithful to Him, their belief in the coming Redeemer. I know in the Old Testament in Isaiah 61, we read that this Redeemer would proclaim liberty to the captives and open up the prison to those who were bound. So let me just tell you this. Whatever the perfect interpretation of this might be, Peter's encouragement gives focus to an old life, a new life, and to the inescapable reality of standing and giving that accounting, standing face to face before God one day. That's what I know. So he continues now as we read verse 7. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Back to attitude again in the last days. In those days, Christians should live with an attitude of serious, diligent prayer. Folks, as, as we see the weight of eternity rushing toward us, we dare not take lightly the, the need for prayer. And, and, and what Peter's writing about, if, if you just examine it in the original, it carries the idea of watchful prayer. It carries the idea of having my heart and my mind right as I watch for, as I eagerly anticipate the return of Jesus. As, as I watch the events of this world in which I live, and I watch myself, I continue to measure my readiness for Jesus coming. Now, I always thought when you got older, you were supposed to get smarter. I'm not sure I believe that anymore. Amen. In just a month or two, I'm going to be 62 years old, and every year as I get older, I feel dumber. I feel like I am more out of touch with the world around me than I am in touch with the world around me. But as I watch the events of the world, I watch myself, and I, I should be about the business of continuing to measure where I am in terms of my readiness for the Lord's return. I cannot think of one single time in my life that I have felt a greater need to be earnest and disciplined in my prayers than I feel right now. But Peter is not yet done with speaking to and speaking about right attitudes. Let's go back to the text now and read 8 through 11. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from His great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God Himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to Him forever and ever. Amen. In light of the last days, in, in light of standing face to face before God, in light of that accounting, in light of eternity, it is important for us to love those we are going to spend eternity with. Deep love. Fervent love for one another. And Peter says it covers over a multitude of sins. Both for the one who is doing the loving and for the one who is being loved. Peter says covers over a multitude of sins. You, you know, in our homes, think about your own home for a moment. In our homes as families, in the church, in this church as a family of believers, many offenses 
are readily forgiven. Many offenses are readily forgotten because we all love God and because we all love each other. I believe in Jesus. I know you believe in Jesus too. And you see, that makes it very easy for me to love you. Makes it very easy for me to forgive you and not hold anything against you. And it makes it very easy for you to do the same for me. It's not that way out in the world. Let's make sure we draw this very clear distinction. In the world where the love of God is lacking, every word that is spoken, every deed that is done is viewed with great suspicion. If you don't believe it, just go home and turn on the news, turn on one of these cable news channels and, and listen to the one that's slanted to the left for a while, then change the channel and listen to the one that's slanted to the right for a while. Every word, every deed, every action, every facial expression, everything is viewed with suspicion. In the world, every action is liable to misunderstanding and conflicts are all around and Satan is delighted. It's thrilled. I have, been, I have been reminded during all the events of the last year and a half just how much the church means to me. Just how much the fellowship of believers means to me personally. And, and I will tell you, I know everybody makes their own decision, but I will, I'll be quite honest and tell you that for me, for Jim personally, I can't get behind saying, you know what, I, I just like staying at home. I think I'm just going to stay at home. I'm just going to dial it up on the television. I need the encouragement. I need the personal encouragement. I, I need the fellowship. I need the love and the camaraderie that I feel when all of us are together. Every single day, I live in and I deal with an ungodly and a perverse world, a sin-filled world. I need to experience the deep love that Peter talks about. I need that. I need it in my walk with Christ. I need it to grow closer to God. And I don't experience that when we're all apart. And Peter says, cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal, Cheerfully share your home with those who might need a place to stay. Love demonstrates itself in hospitality. Do it cheerfully. You might have a translation that says, do it without grumbling. I looked it up and in the Greek, that term without grumbling means this. Are you ready? Here's the definition. It, it, mean, it denotes a low muttering. Now, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. It denotes a low muttering as a sign of displeasure. And we all know what that means because we all do it from time to time. So I'll just use me as an example. I mutter to and I mutter at myself. I do it pretty regularly. Now, I work outside every day, all day, and I work mostly by myself, and I will catch myself muttering at me. I don't yell at myself. I, I mutter at myself. I am, uh, I am currently renovating, doing a major renovation on a 125-year-old barn on my farm. It is a big, big job. So a couple of weeks ago, while roofing that barn, I fell off. No matter how I fell off or why, the, the end result is I fell off. I hit the ground like this. I hit the ground face first. And I'm telling you, when I hit the ground, it knocked the wind out of me. It was one of those where you're laying there and you know you just hear this squeaking sound where you're trying to get your, your breath. And it left a very large bruise right here in the middle of my chest. I hit some of the roofing purlings on my way down that at first that, that mark was red and purple. It did not turn to a black bruise like you might have expected. It went to green. And then it went to yellow. And then it went to an almost harvest gold. I mean, this was a deep, deep 
bruise. Well, I wasn't done with the roofing project, so that meant I had to get back up there. So the next time I got back up there, you know what I was doing? I was just lowly, quietly muttering to myself. Okay, dummy, pay attention to where you are. Watch your feet. Pay attention to where you're standing. Pay attention to what you're doing. Don't fall off this thing like you did the last time. You might not be so lucky. Now, it's one thing to mutter to and about myself. It's quite another to do it about others I have been called to serve. Christians should often open their homes to others and do it cheerfully. Peter says, do it without grumbling, don't mutter. And folks, those of you who have done this, those of you who have practiced this, you know that the practice of hospitality is at times costly and burdensome and, and sometimes it's even irritating. And Peter identifies it as an example of demonstrating and showing deep love. He also says that love will show itself, will demonstrate itself as we give to the church family from the gifts that God has given to us. I love the way the NLT translates this. God has given each of you a gift from His great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well. To serve one another. Don't you ever say, well, God has not gifted me. He may have gifted you or he may have gifted the person beside me, but God has never gifted me. He certainly hasn't uniquely gifted me in some way. Don't you ever say that because that's not true. It is not true. Peter would say it is not true. God has indeed gifted you, uniquely gifted you, and you are supposed to be a good steward of that gift to love others and to serve them. I read that this week, and it made me think about 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. If you think about that chapter, it's where Paul talks about this idea of, of recounting how God has now called him into his service and how God has used him to serve the cause of Christ. And in verse 9, that's that text where Paul says, let me tell you something about me and being an apostle. I am the least of all the apostles. As a matter of fact, Paul said, I am not even worthy to be called an apostle. I really shouldn't wear this title. I shouldn't be in this category because of the way I persecuted God's church. You remember all that? Well, when you get to verse 10, that's where Paul says, but whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out His special favor on me and not without result. Paul is very clear that he was what he was only by God's grace. But at the same time, God's grace toward him was not in vain. And the reason it wasn't in vain is Paul took what God gave him and he used it. He put it to work. He put it to service for the kingdom. The, the implication is very, very clear. If we are bad stewards of the manifold grace of God, it is as if that grace was given to us in vain. And that grace is wasted though because although God sent it to us, we didn't allow it to work. We didn't put it to use. We've not allowed it to move through us. Friends, God has gifted you in some way, in some unique way. God has gifted you perhaps in many ways. And not only has He provided the gift, Peter says, let me also remind you, He has given you the strength and the energy that you need to use it for His glory. So I'm going to ask you this morning, what is your gift? What is it? What's your gift? Are you using it to serve others and thus to give glory to God? Are you using it cheerfully? Are you using it with the right attitude or are you just muttering? Just sort of going along muttering because you have to. Right attitudes in our walk as believers. Well, there is yet another attitude that Peter will now address. And that is enduring your trials with the right attitude. Let's read verses 12 and 13. 
Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in His suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing His glory when it is revealed to all the world. Instead of seeing their trials, and you will note that Peter calls them fiery trials. Instead of seeing them as some sort of strange occurrences, Peter is telling his readers and he's telling all of us to see them as ways to be partners with Jesus Christ. Ways to be in partnership with our Lord in His suffering. If we partake of His sufferings, Peter says we're also going to partake of His, his glory and His joy. Now I read that and I thought, you know, this is the same man who in Mark chapter 8 told Jesus to avoid the suffering of the cross. And it seemed so strange to Peter at that point in his life that Jesus would even entertain that. That he would, would even think about suffering. But now, it seems so strange to Peter that Jesus could have even imagined anything less. Let us not forget that Jesus partook of our humanity and of human suffering. And because he did that, because he was not immune from it, our suffering is not meaningless. And that means it is good to share anything with Jesus, even his suffering. None of us has faced the persecution that, that some of Peter's readers faced, that some of the early believers did. None of us has faced that. But we are continually moving in the direction in our society and in our culture of being persecuted in a lot of different ways because of our belief in God and in righteousness. And Peter says, listen, don't be surprised. Don't act like this is something strange. It is not. And just be glad that you are being made a partner with Jesus. And then he adds verses 14, 15, and 16, an explanation of the difference between suffering as a Christian and suffering as an evildoer. If you're insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you'll be blessed, for the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by His name. Note that Peter says suffering for the name of Christ actually becomes a blessing to you. It shows that you are identified with Him. It shows that you are following Him. It confirms it. As I mentioned a moment ago, more and more in our world, we are now being insulted for bearing the name of Jesus, for, for believing and standing as proponents of what He has told us we should believe. Peter says, you shouldn't be surprised that the world reacts that way. Take it. It means that the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. And he also clarifies, and I'm glad that he does, by recognizing not all suffering that is out there comes in the name of Jesus. Suffering as an evildoer listen carefully now, is suffering that is deserved. Suffering as an evildoer is suffering that is deserved. I think I told you a couple of weeks ago that my dad, as he raised four boys, used to say to us, boys, life is hard. It's even harder if you're stupid. I think he had a good point. I think he had a good point. Suffering as an evildoer is suffering that is deserved. Now here's where the rub comes in. Part of our societal problem that we have today is this notion that evil should not be punished. This whole idea that there should be no consequence for evil. There should be no suffering for wrongdoing. And folks, I think you, go, you already see that when we subscribe to that kind of thinking, the natural order of good and evil that God has established, all of that gets turned upside down and we face a lot of unfortunate consequences. 
I also find it quite interesting that it, as Peter makes this list of things that ought to bring deserved suffering, would you look at that list very carefully? I, I just found it so fascinating that as Peter writes about murder and stealing and making trouble, did you notice that he includes in that same list prying into other people's affairs? Maybe you have a translation that says, being a busy body. You know, this is not the first time that Peter's made mention of that. And it seems like I read Paul making mention of, of that whole idea of mind your business. You know, I told you before, there are five little guys at, at, on our family farm compound there, five of them. And, and I will tell you that uh, one boy by himself can get into a lot of stuff. When you put two together, it, it compounds it. it. It it doubles the effect. Then when you put three together, then when you put four together. But I will tell you that the math gets bigger the larger the group that is gathered. So when you put five of them together, I mean, it, it's a hundredfold what one can do by himself. And so I find myself often saying a three-word phrase, mind your business, mind your business, mind your business, mind your business. And it's just, it's so interesting to me that Peter has this list of, of these sins that we think are, boy, these are the big ones, murder and stealing and making trouble. And he adds to that list prying into other people's affairs, being a busybody. Friends, evildoers often do suffer a great deal of grief and pain for their deeds. Now listen carefully to what I'm going to tell you. They are supposed to. They're supposed to. That's the way it's supposed to work. But Peter says when an evildoer is suffering for his or her evil deeds, that is not for the sake of Jesus. It's not the same kind of suffering that some of his fellow believers were experiencing. It is simply the consequences of their own foolish actions. Suffering as a Christian is nothing to be ashamed of, but instead is an opportunity Peter says to give glory to God. So, we close this chapter beginning at verse 17. For the time has come for judgment and it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? So, if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what's right and trust your lives to the God who created you for he will never fail you. In this context of suffering, Peter tells us judgment begins at or with the house of God. Now, the life we're living right now, folks, this is our time of fiery trial. I want to make sure I explain this as clearly as I can. The ungodly will have their time of fiery trial later. For the Christian, the issue of punishment was settled once and for all and forever at the cross. Charles Spurgeon writes, there is equity in it. For Christians profess to be better than others, and so they ought to be. They say they're a holy people, separated under Christ, so they ought to be holy, as he was. In this text, Peter's sobering application is very clear. If the suffering he has talked about is what God's children experience, what in the world will become of those who have made themselves God's enemies? How can they ever hope to stand before God in judgment and face the wrath of God? Think about it this way. The suffering experiences that we have in this world as Christians... The suffering we experience in this life, do you realize those are the worst that the believer will ever face throughout all of eternity? That's it, folks. That's the worst. We have seen the worst. Ah, but for, for those who reject Jesus, they have seen, conversely, the best they will ever experience. And the worst is forever yet to come. It's pretty sobering, don't you think? 
And Peter quotes from Proverbs 11:31, if the righteous are barely saved, what's going to happen to godless sinners? The implication is self-evident. Now, I understand that we don't like to think about, we don't like to talk about, and we don't even like to preach about the coming judgment much anymore. But friends, there is indeed a terrible fate, Peter calls it, that awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news. So you know what that means for us? That means we got a job to do. we got work to do. To live right, to love right, to share right. Just what that good news is and to rescue as many people as we possibly can from themselves and from the power of sin in their life. I'm thankful for Peter. I'm thankful for his straightforwardness. I'm thankful for his encouragement. And I would tell you of chapter 4 that these are indeed the words of God for us, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you for being in our class this morning.